Well, welcome. Um, it's uh, August 22nd, 207. This is the Culture, Arts, and Parks Committee. I'm Nick Licata, the chair. And joining me at the table is Judy Castro, vice chair, and Frank Fidio, my legislative aide. Um, and we'll begin with Wordsworth, and Frank will introduce our new poet curator for the next period of six months. That's right. Thanks, Nick. Uh, Carlos Martinez graduated from Antioch University with a Master of Fine Arts in Creative Writing this June. He hopes to find a position uh, teaching composition, literature, and creative writing at a local college. He has published in the Crab Creek Review, a local magazine, as well as Fourth Street, based in Olympia. The Black Bear Review, the Marpo Review, haven't heard of that one, and the Pittsburgh Review. So with uh, no further ado, can uh, everyone please lend their ears to Carlos? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Councilmember Nicastro, it's, it's a pleasure and a privilege to be here before you today, as well as an honor to have been selected as the curator for the reading series for these next six months. Um, I can promise you that the people who will come to read before this committee as uh, the months proceed are among the best and most excellent poets in Seattle. Seattle is fortunate in that it has a surfeit of poetic talent. There are many, many good writers who live here in this city, and I am privileged to know, uh, I am privileged to know some of them and to have asked them to participate in this, and I think you're, you're in for a treat as they come before you in future weeks. I guess I go first with a poem. Um, one of the cardinal rules in poetry is that you never, ever write about children because what you write then tends to be very sentimental. But I'm heartened by a comment that Raymond Carver, the noted short story writer made, was that his writing was best in, and, and most well informed, not by other writers and not by books, but by his children. It was them that made him the writer that he was. This poem is called The Pleasure of Parenting. And the reference in the last line, uh, since it seems to be a little vague, is to mortality, the pleasure of parenting. It's the same routine every night. First, the children don't want to clean their rooms. Then they don't want to eat whatever's been cooked for them. Then the issue is baths. They don't want to take them. Then the pajamas don't quite fit, and the books they want to read aren't the books they want to read. And then when the lights are out, they don't want to fall asleep even if you lie down with them and spend an hour or more of the dwindling night cooing and singing, making comforting parenting noises. What they do is toss and turn, kick and lash out until someone somewhere in a darkened room becomes very loud. The walls hum with anger. The floorboards rise up as if an earthquake happens. The cats jump from the end of the bed and scatter fur sticking straight up and the light bulbs shatter. Then the children are offended. They cross their arms and swivel on their hips away from you, facing the wall as if it's about to open up and let them in someplace better, where frazzled parents don't exist. They can have dessert any hour of the day or night, and school and homework were never invented. So the night drags on, and you remember when all it took was a stern look, a frown, or in desperate situations, a swat on the bottom, and then you fell asleep quietly. Now the children threaten to sue if you touch them, promise to tell the authorities you are being brutal, their word, and you know that the heavens will part and the gods will strike you down because the gods, after all, have a sense of humor, and nothing you can say or do will drain your children of their exuberance the lives they'll lose soon enough anyway. Thank you. We will uh, begin with uh, Wordsworth and uh, introduce the poet. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair, Councilmember Steinbrook, Lisa. It's my pleasure to once again introduce one of Seattle's fine poets, Kathleen Flanagan. Kathleen teaches poetry, writing at the UW Experimental College and she was recently appointed an artist in residence for the Washington State Arts Commission. She gets to do what she wants most to do, which is teach poetry to children. She has published widely in local and national journals, including upcoming issues of the Northwest Review, the Crab Creek Review, and Pontoon Number no. 5. Her poems were nominated for a 2001 Pushcart Prize. <coughs> 
Kathleen and her husband Steve are proud citizens of Seattle, and their three charming children attend <laughs> Seattle Public Schools. Kathleen Flanagan. Thank you, Carlos. Thank you to Carlos Martinez for inviting me, and thank you to the council for letting me into your chambers. Uh, this poem features a Seattle icon. Preservation. Bobo awaits my third grade class at the forgotten end of the museum. I explain when they finish beating their chests that Bobo was a famous gorilla I saw at the zoo when I was seven. That here he looks false because he's stuffed and mounted upright like a man. We take in his flared nostrils and hair, the virility of his chocolate-colored chest. Everyone, even Dylan, falls silent for a moment, long enough to remember you left me four weeks ago yesterday, a rubber band snap to my inner cranium for the thousandth time today. Bess and Tran point to photos of Bobo as a baby, dressed in a nightgown, being fed a bottle, Bobo smiling at his birthday party. Happier days. I think irrelevantly of the milk expiring in my refrigerator, how attached I am to the date on the carton, the day before the world went sour. Even milk observes the rights of decomposition, the holy rights that Bobo was denied. Is that so wrong? Roy Rogers stuffed and mounted Trigger, his companion, wasn't that sweet testament, if sad and strange? Bobo, do you understand the impulse? I gaze into your fake glass eyes, but you decline to answer. I'm talking to myself, your look implies. We both stand awkwardly with nothing to say. The kids are restless. They're talking about ice cream and the bus outside. He was real, I remind them, but they're running up the hall. The last time I saw him, he was alive. And we'll begin, as we usually do, with Wordsworth and a um, poetry session curated by Carlos Mart Martinez. And Carlos, would you like to introduce the poet today? Thank you, Mr. Chair. It is a pleasure to introduce today's poet, who is Catherine Wayne. She was born in New York City, but grew up in Kentucky. And she studied poetry with Michael Harper at Brown University. And she is currently enrolled in the University of Washington's MFA program in poetry. She has had recent work in Fine Madness and Hubbub, uh, two fine literary magazines, and has older work appearing in Poetry Now, Bellowing Ark, Chrysanthemum, and Tinfish. She's also been a featured reader at places such as Red Sky, It's About Time, Wit's End, the Fry Art Museum, and at Open Books, a, a poem emporium, the Seattle Slam, and Bumbershoot. I present to you Catherine Wing. OK. As I've said to others, this is my uh, most political poem. <laughs> uh, monorail or in lieu of monorail, maybe fairy tale highway. <laughs> it's called Ford Falcon and the El Camino. There once a car which flew winged Chrysler finned for current bird had loft. It lived in the underbrush by an abandoned state root and barn at 20 degrees off center, which is to say where it was. This dart car like Saturn slung its way through path and rover with three trustees, the antenna ball, windshield, and adjustable side mirror. Firebird went where nowhere without them sows, sows it said, and fast was friendship and fast was Mercury Bird. One day Ball said, let's jump this dead wood, and Shield said, for a ride, for a circle, and Mirror said, yup. So Rambler Bird reversed his road, this tree, and went down a different branch, right fork fast, past teacup and spoon, licorice palace and pumpkin, tea at the tongue of the boot, making wind behind them and feeling it out front, friends with air, finally, no other language but their own Cadillac talk and Pontiac chatter. 
when on what but a road they stopped for something to see, seeing something, beans and sprouts stand with a berry and bean girl selling Studebaker seedling ranchero beans and pinto peas. They saw it shack old seedling bean sprout girl selling and stopped in the gremlin air. Bird wanted sprouting, ball wanted seeing, mirror, wa mirror wanted beaning, shield wanted nothing but said, yup, nonetheless. Sprout berry girl had hubcap eyes, saw nothing but being seen said, well, trustees, I have a tulip for a bloom, what say? But they said, no, seeing a curb against the wheel. They said, no, burying an explorer of afternoon. But again, no, wanting, sprouting, sproutling. And she, well, maybe I don't have but nothing for you then. But maybe a question for an answer, if you like. Blind bean berry sprout said. And shield, bird, mirror, and ball convened to figure their question said, does everyone die or is it fall asleep? What of happily ever after? Is this the land far, far away or hidden in the dark woods? Spindle, briar, coal, knapsack, needle, and egg. Each one they turned over like root balls in a garden, but finally bird said, ah, yes, I know the perfect question. And they whispered and all said, ah, and then asked, Bean girl, will the highway come to our home? And the girl smiled an eye light smile and said, ah, yes, of course, yes. Uh, Frank Video will uh, introduce uh, our poet today, who is Julie, Julie uh, Larios. Frank? Oh, thanks, Nick. Uh, Julie Larios is a poet studying for her Master of Fine Arts degree at the University of Washington, where she also serves as the managing editor of Poetry Northwest magazine. Um, I will allow Julie to add anything to that that she might, uh, but in the meantime, please lend your ears to Julie. Thank you. Thanks for inviting me. Um, before I begin with my own poem, I'd like to say that I read through the committee's agenda today online. I might not be correct about a couple of items that were going to be up for discussion. One of them I noticed said, walk for capitalism, the other clocks for the millennium. And I thought that the rhyme and the cadence of those two items combined on the same agenda was really outstanding, and I'd like to thank whatever hidden, uncelebrated poet put those together. I do think that poetry is all around us, and if you, any of you ride home on the bus today, just listen, because it's out there. Recovery. Outside the skin, of course, nothing is in. It's under the membranes, mind begins. But don't be surprised by blood. Don't be surprised by anything. Outside the skin lies everything other. Feather floating there, drop of water, air, chlorophyll, carbon, box math, Blake's lamb, and our children singing. Of course, nothing, nothing is in the leaf screen cell, nothing I see. We ask ourselves, how blind is any body to its own breathing? Something rises, falls. It might be a man's chest or a tree's shadow. It's under the membranes, the mind. The mind's wind-up works hard at its tick-tocking we hear the cuckoo every hour while the primed pump gushes. A scene stealer that gets away with murder until the mind begins to whir and tip <coughs> to govern. Not everything inside is chaos, of course. 
in the bones, marrow, around the tongue, ice warmed to melting. But don't be surprised by blood, if blood does come, soaking sponges, rubber gloves, stainless steel tools on a tray, the tile walls and floors, the closed circuit screen. Blood has its bloody ways. Don't be surprised by anything the body does, in fact. Later in recovery, tilt your head back. Look into the hard skull and listen. Do you hear something new in the background? A white noise. Do you hear that other body humming? Thank you. Thank you.